And we can go to the next one. I'm sorry, that's just our title slide. Let's look at this in totality. Um, the epidemiology of cardiovascular disease for the United States of America, and for the world for that matter at this point, it is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. And I want this to be important for both men and women. Um, approximately 656,000 Americans die from heart disease every year. That's one in four deaths, or 25% of all deaths recorded in our country. Basically, and sadly, there is one death every 36 seconds in this country for cardiovascular death, um, which is astounding and frightening to think about that people are having heart attacks pretty much every three to four minutes out there for a multitude of reasons. Sadly, it's increasing in other countries around the world, uh, the largest uh, growing industrialized nations like China or India. Um, so we're not immune that we have sent our, sadly, our unhealthy heart, unhealthy how should I say, our unhealthy diet overseas, as well as cigarettes and inactivity. Breaking it down through demographics, about 1 in 13 white males, or 7.7%, 1 in 14 African-American men, or 7.1%, and 1 in 17 Hispanic males, 17.5%, have coronary disease. Interestingly, only 1 in 25 Asian men, and if you look at the next one, 1 in 30 Asian women, and by Asian, I'm including mainly Southeast Asia of China, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and southern parts of India. One in four men die of cardiovascular disease in this country. And if you look down to the one below it, surprisingly, one in three women die from cardiovascular disease, and 45% of women over age 20 have some form of heart disease. That breaks down to approximately a little bit higher for women or a little bit lower than compared to their male colleagues, one in 16 white women, or 6.2%, 6.5% for African-American women, 6% for Hispanic, and again, as noted above, lower for Asian women, one in 30, or 3.2%. So this begs the question, why, if there's a higher incidence in men, do we have a higher mortality in women? And I'll give you some thoughts at the end of the discussion as to why that may be. Uh, next slide, please. Here are the major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And it's important you know this, not only for yourself, but if you're a mom or a dad, know it for your children and grandchildren, know it for your friends and your family, your aunts and uncles, uh, your parents and grandparents. The number one cause of cardiovascular disease in the United States of America is high blood pressure or hypertension. Currently, that's defined by the American Heart Association or American College of Cardiology any blood pressure reading greater than 130 over 80. Likewise, the second most common cause for cardiovascular disease are elevated cholesterol. And by this, I don't just mean the total cholesterol number. There are four numbers that I want you to remember. Total cholesterol, LDL, which is low density lipoprotein, HDL, which is high density lipoprotein, and triglycerides. In theory, a standard cutoff for most adults should be a total cholesterol uh, it should be less than 150. If it's greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter, it's obviously too high. An LDL greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter is considered too high. And an HDL less than 40 for men or HDL less than 50 for women is considered abnormal. Lastly, trigly triglyceride levels greater than 150 milligrams are also considered elevated. So we need to know these numbers, and you should certainly know these numbers. Jot them down whenever you meet for your yearly physical with your family doctor, a nurse practitioner, or a PA, whoever you consider your primary care physician. You absolutely should know your blood pressure readings as well as your lipid profile. Third most common risk factor is diabetes. That is considered to be an elevated blood sugar above 126 milligrams per deciliter after an eight-hour fast, or we'll be measuring the blood as positions is considered a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5%. This has become much more common in our country in the last 20 years. It is truly considered to be an epidemic amongst our endocrinologists who treat diabetes. And again, the major factors for this is an increasing rate of obesity and sadly increasing levels of sedentary lifestyle, which people just aren't exercising anymore. 
Number five, smoking or any tobacco products, whether it's cigarette smoking, vaping, dipping, chewing, or chewing tobacco, these will also put you at a much higher risk for cardiovascular disease. And then uh, lastly, family genetics. If either of your parents, or more importantly, if you've had a sibling, suffer a heart attack or a stroke before the age of 50, this puts you at a significantly higher risk level. Lastly, and more commonly as noted, men will often have a higher risk of heart disease, but for women it's more lethal. And the reason being that women are generally protected from heart disease through their early years, at least through menopause, but once the woman is through menopause and the HDL levels drop, they quickly accelerate to have a heart attack rate comparable to men within their age group in the sixth and seventh decade. Next slide, please. So what should our objectives for a healthy lifestyle be? It's very simple. Again, based upon the study, looking back retrospectively over 30 to 40,000 patients in our country, and these are hard to do these days, especially when we're under lockdown, especially if you've got to stay in and gain, as we say, the quarantine 15, but we really must aim for an appropriate body weight. We need to stay on a very heart-healthy diet. If you do smoke, you need to quit or talk to your primary care physician about how mechanisms to quit smoking or any tobacco product, vaping, dipping, or chewing. And I would include in that even recreational marijuana use is still considered a form of smoking. And Ken, um, whether people think it's good or bad, I won't get into that discussion today, but I will say smoke is smoke. If you're inhaling, inhaling some form of tobacco or marijuana, it leads to significant changes in your physiology within your lungs, and more importantly, within your vasculature of your heart and major arteries. Um, we do recommend, or we should say, it's okay to drink alcohol, but always in moderation. It's been a very stressful year, and sadly, we have seen a number of studies showing an increased rate of alcohol misuse and alcohol-related disorders. And we'll go through each of these uh, slide by slide. Most importantly, and the one I really like to advocate for all my patients, I tell them this is the one prescription that I write all the time, but it's up to you to get it filled. And that's regular outdoor or indoor physical activity or physical exercise. I can preach until the cows come home about how important this is, but it's really up to the individual to get out there and start moving. Let's go through them one at a time. Next slide. A little more detail. What is an appropriate body weight? Well, the American Heart Association recommends a BMI, which is known as a body mass index, between 18.5 and 24.9. Okay, Dave, what the heck's a BMI? The BMI is simply your weight in kilograms divided by your body surface area, or I'm sorry, your height, in, your height in meters squared. You can pull up this on any app or any smartphone or any iPhone that you have, plug in BMI calculation, and simply put in your weight and your height, and it will tell you what your classification is for your BMI. We define overweight as a BMI between 25 and 29.9, and then obesity is any BMI over 30 or greater. Next slide. Here's the sad fact. In our country, we're now considered one of the most obese countries in the world. The adult obesity rate in the United States is currently 42.4%. If I look back in my generation in high school, back in the 70s and 80s or med school, the obesity rate was not greater than 15%, and that was going back to 1978 to 79. The national adult obesity crisis has increased 26% in just 12 years. And that's not good because we know obesity can portend a multitude of medical problems, as we've seen this year. Those patients who are obese have a much more difficult time with any type of infection if they do get COVID-19. It leads to a higher incidence of hypertension, um, what we call difficulty metabolizing sugar. So many diabetics do develop type 2 diabetes. And it's also very hard on your ankles, knees, and hips to make it much more difficult to get out and do the exercise we would like for you to do. Um, the trend is also sadly going to our children. We now have a childhood obesity rate of 19.3% in ages 2 to 19 for all Americans. The highest rates of obesity are, as you would expect, in areas where we have more rural populations, lower socioeconomic status, and as many know, more difficulty getting to good heart-healthy foods. 
Obesity rates also vary by race. In the African American community, it's at 49.6%. For Hispanic Americans in the adult area, it's 44.8%. For white adults, it's 42.2%. And we were talking earlier, why is the cardiovascular and stroke rate lower for Asian Americans? Well, here's one example. The obesity rate for Asian adults is only 17.4%. What's sad through all this, as I mentioned earlier, this is a huge cost to our healthcare system. Obesity is considered a medical problem. I don't think any physicians or physician assistants or nurse practitioners look upon it as someone being weak or just stuffing their face all the time. It's no different than someone who has type 2 diabetes or hypertension or any other medical problem, but it is costing our health care system over $149 billion annually, which is a lot for us to make up. Next slide, please. Here's just a little chart for you to remember. Uh, you're considered underweight if your BMI is 18.5 or less. You're considered normal BMI if you're 18.5 to 24.9. You're overweight if that BMI is 25 to 29.9. And then you're considered the obese category, which leads to the diabetes, the hypertension, the higher risk of heart attack if your BMI is 30 to 35. And sadly, considered very obese or extremely obese once the BMI is greater than 35. And again, to do a BMI calculation, it's your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. You can pull this up on any uh, phone that you have and quickly do this calculation. Next slide, please. Now I want to get into the next issue. What's a healthy diet? Well, for years, at least when I was in grade school and high school and college, we were taught the classic food pyramid. This was best for adults. It was a balance of meats and vegetables and saturated fats and unsaturated fats. But since 1992, we have discovered through retrospective analysis that this food pyramid was grossly flawed and very inaccurate. Sadly, it was preached to us so that in the 50s and 60s, we were a meat and potato nation. Steaks that were full of fat, potatoes with sour cream and butter. Then in the 60s, we said, well, maybe this isn't so good. Let's start using margarine and trans fat and eating more carbohydrates in the form of white starch, white bread, white rice, potatoes. And now we have this major obesity rate because of these errors in judgment for the food pyramid. We as humans have evolved as what's known as an omnivore. And an omnivore pretty much eats anything plants, fruits, vegetables, a fish, crab, shrimp, meats of different sort. It's a whole myriad of foods that we have evolved to develop our, um, basically our whole digestive tract. There is excellent evidence now that the best diet to follow for both cardiovascular health as well as physical health is what's known as the Mediterranean diet. This diet is high in fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts in moderation, lean meats, especially seafood, or what they call the pesco Mediterranean, low-fat dairy, preferentially low-fat milks and yogurts, and fermented yogurts like Greek yogurt, and mono, and I'll say it again, monounsaturated fats, which are paramount. We want to use the extra virgin olive oil or canola oil. We don't want to use lard or foods that are made in saturated fat. Next slide. Here is the new pyramid, our food pyramid based on the Mediterranean diet. If you look at the bottom of the base of the pyramid, every day we should have some form of physical activity and enjoy meals with others. Again, we know right now that's very difficult to do with restrictions around our country because of the COVID-19 virus, but I do think it's important we still have some sort of social interaction for sanity, for good mental health, even if it's through Skype or FaceTime or WebEx, whatever it may be, it's important to keep up with your family and friends. Look at the largest portion above the base now of our everyday meals should be around as many fresh fruits or fresh vegetables as you want, whole wheat grains, olive oil, which I would again recommend extra virgin olive oil, beans, nuts, legumes, seeds, and spices. What about protein? Well, preferentially, it would be best to get this from fish and seafood. I always remind my patients, please try to use fresh seafood over farm rates. The fresh seafood, whether it's North Atlantic salmon or Alaskan salmon or mackerel or sardines, they give you the omega-3 fatty acids that you do not get in farm-raised fish. Uh, lastly, 
when we look at the very vertex of the top of this pyramid, we can have these weekly, which would be poultry, such as turkey or chicken. Eggs are certainly reasonable. And remember, there has never been a study that has shown by eating eggs no more than five eggs a week, leading to an increase in cholesterol or increase in heart disease. Low-fat cheese and yogurt. Last on our list, and at the very top of this pyramid, which is not usual for the American diet, would be meats and sweets. So it's important to get the, the heavy-duty meats or the heavy-duty sweets and carbohydrates out of our diets, not only for weight loss, but for our cardiovascular health. Next slide, please. Here are the foods that are most often recommended. For seafood, we want fresh, fatty fish, as I mentioned, salmon, sardines, mackerel, shrimp. If you're going to use an oil, preferentially the extra virgin olive oil or canola oil. Mixed nuts, walnuts, almonds, or hazelnuts, probably no more than a handful per day. Fresh vegetables, whatever you like. They're all good for us. I know it's going to be more of a time of year where we lose in our farmer's market, but whether it's um, broccoli or beans or sprouts or um, any type of fresh green leafy vegetable you like, ideal. Any fresh fruit, I have a preference for blueberry, certainly citrus, oranges, apples, pears, peaches. Legumes include beans, peas, peanuts, lentils, and soybeans. As I mentioned, eggs are perfectly fine, just not in excess. Dairy, preferentially a low-fat milk. Yogurt, unsweetened or Greek is pref uh, much more preferred. Low-fat cheese and kefir. Kefir is a type of fermented pourable yogurt that a lot of GI doctors mention, uh, recommend nowadays to improve um, the probiotics in your gut. Whole grains, such as barley, whole oats, corn, or quinoa, um, buckwheat, if you have accessibility to it, and wild-type brown rice. What about drinks? Dave, what should I drink? Ideally, fresh water. It's been shown in study after study that whether you drink a carbonated beverage, a sweetened or unsweetened beverage, it can lead to a higher incidence of diabetes and what we call abdominal adiposity or fat around our gut and stomach. Perfectly reasonable to drink coffee or tea. There's a lot of good flavonoids and antioxidants in coffee and tea. And we'll go on to our last slide to talk about what's the total alcohol you should take on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide. That's just some pictures. If you look on the left side of the slide, you see your fresh peas and string beans. There's some ginger in there. Gotta love blueberries. Gotta love any fresh fruit you want. Some barley, broccoli, cherries and beets, salmon in the middle, celery, um, certainly lettuce. And then on the right, our citrus fruit, maybe some sunflower seeds. Avocado is certainly a wonderful um, vegetable to have. Almonds, um, barley, apples, right on down the line, and Brussels sprouts. Just remember, think of what the folks eat around the Mediterranean Sea, whether it was from the Greek or Italians or, or even in the Moroccan area. This is pretty much has been shown how we've evolved to have the best health. Next slide, please. These are what you really need to avoid when you look at your diet. Stay away from any processed meats. I know they taste good, but they're not good for you. Again, I tell my patients, you may love them. They're not loving you back. Bacon, sausage, hot dogs, ham, deli meats, cold cuts. I would stay away from any sweets with added sugar, cookies, cakes, pies, and candy. Remember that? We just got through Halloween. Got to get that sugar out of our system. We're coming up on Thanksgiving and the Christmas and the Hanukkah and Ramadan holidays, as well as Kwanzaa. That's a time of year where we tend to get together with families and we way overdo it with the sweets. Excess starches or refined carbohydrates, what do I mean by that? Well, primarily white bread, mashed potatoes or white potatoes, rolls, flour tortillas, chips, white rice, uh, any sort of pasta which is not homemade. All of those things, all of those starches need to stay out of our diet because they go right to our abdominal area and again lead to a higher rate of obesity higher rate of type 2 diabetes. For goodness sake, if you can take one thing out of a refrigerator now that's simple and you should never use again, throw out the margarine or trans fats. Please read labels. Anything that says trans fat and it probably not good for us, and there are a lot of snack foods that claim to be heart healthy when they have a large amount of trans fats in them. Artificially sweetened beverages or foods, carbonated soda drinks, sweetened juices, 
energy drinks. And lastly, please limit the amount of salt you have. Foods that are high in salt or sodium chloride, be extra careful about. These can lead to a higher incidence of hypertension. The bottom line for all this is you got to start reading labels. When you go to the grocery store, read labels and try your best to make sure that you avoid these trans fats, uh, high fructose corn syrup, added sugars, uh, excess starches, uh, and excess salt in your food products. Next slide, please. Let's look at the next slide on our topic here, which is smoking. Um, sadly, tobacco remains the single largest preventable cause of death in the USA. I had a wonderful, wonderful mentor in medical school who told us once, if you look at smoking cigarettes and you read the package and directions, if used as directed, it will certainly cause some form of death or cancer. Um, and that's, that's not a good thing. Cigarette smoking kills more than 480,000 Americans every year, and this would include complications of heart attack, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, um, and cancer. Smoking-related illnesses in the U.S., again, look at this number. That's B as in billion, 300 billion per year. Our healthcare economy cannot sustain this uh, outlay of money for these illnesses, which are all preventable if people do not smoke. In 2018, it was estimated that 13.7% of U.S. adults were current smokers, and 74.6% of that 13.4% were everyday smokers. So we still have some room for improvement. We certainly know that um, it seems to be a little bit higher in areas where people are under a lot of stress. Um, thank goodness we don't see a lot of that or any advertisements on TV as I did as a kid where we had things like Virginia Slims, you've come a long way, baby. Um, but still, our teenagers and our young adults will get into smoking, and a step to that is vaping and using products that they think are safe, which really aren't. The health consequences of smoking, as you would expect, are heart attack, stroke, PAD, or peripheral arterial disease, including aneurysms of the thoracic aorta, chronic lung disease, and a multitude of cancers. It's not just lung cancer. Next slide, please. If you look at this list on both the left on the orange print and on the right on the green print, the orange tells you all the cancers that can be associated from the multiple carcinogens from smoking. These include head or neck cancers, obviously lung cancer, which also includes the trachea and the bron um, bronchioles. Leukemia incidence goes up. Because of the smoke, we have a higher incidence of stomach cancer, kidney cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, bladder, and amazingly, even cervical cancer. The chronic diseases that we have talked about are stroke, blindness, gum infection, uh, aortic rupture, as I said, smokers have a much higher incidence of abdominal aortic aneurysm, more commonly in men, but both for men and women smokers, coronary artery disease or heart disease, pneumonia, as we've seen again from this year. Sadly, those patients that are chronic smokers or have some form of lung disease have a much more difficult time and a higher mortality rate if they do get coronavirus. Hardening of the arteries, also known as atherosclerosis, chronic lung disease, uh, reduced fertility for those women or men who are considering have children. And for women, as they get older, it decreases bone density and can lead to a higher risk of hip fracture, which has about a 33 and a third percent risk of death. Next slide, please. How do we quit? It's not easy. The first thing I've done with my patients, I tell them I'm not their adversary. I try to be their friend. And the most important thing to consider is what I point to my old noggin up here. It's the brain. Until a patient is psychologically and mentally ready to give up smoking, no therapy or a pharmacologic agent will really work. Um, I first recommend talking with your primary care provider to let them know that you're ready and willing to quit. Consider nicotine replacement as a start with either nicotine gum or nicotine patches. If those do not work well for you or you've had problems with those supplements, or I should say those over-the-counter medications, then your physician or PA or nurse practitioner consider, could consider bupropion, which is Wellbutrin, or varincycline, which is Chantix. I have patients who have done well with other therapies. Certainly, they've done well with hypnosis or acupuncture. And I would recommend that you go to the CDC website to look for tips and tools to help you quit 
um, the cigarette smoking addiction. It's cdc.gov, and they have an app that you can actually put on your phone called Quit Start App. You can get that through any of the um, smartphones that you have. Next slide, please. Let's go on to our next important part for living a long, heart healthy life, alcohol intake. No physician, PA, nurse practitioner, or provider of health care or nurse is going to recommend alcohol right off the bat. But as a society, alcohol, as we saw from the shutdown, is considered important to many, many people. Consuming too much alcohol can certainly result in a myriad of health problems. Excess alcohol intake can increase the level of triglycerides in your blood and lead to a higher risk of heart disease. Alcohol intake can also increase vasoconstriction of your arteries and lead to a higher incidence of hypertension or high blood pressure. And it certainly is considered somewhat of a toxin for those long-standing chronic drinkers to lead to a higher risk of liver cirrhosis and liver cancer, as well as esophageal and stomach cancer. But with that said, the American Heart Association, Heart Association recognizes that moderate alcohol, again, based upon their Mediterranean diet, and consumption of one to two drinks per day per men for men, and no more than one drink per day for women, actually has been associated with a higher incidence of heart health. How do we define a drink? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It could be simply one 12 ounce bottle or can of beer, four ounces of wine, or 1.5 ounces of an 80 proof spirit or liquor, or a one ounce of 100 proof spirit or liquor. Remember, alcohol in excess is never going to be recommended by any healthcare provider. Likewise, alcohol above this amount recommended is really a much of uh, a useless energy input of excess calories for you that will lead to obesity, especially when you get above three, four, five beers a day or three, four mixed drinks a day. Not only are you going to lead to consequences of alcohol misuse, but you're also going to have higher incidence of increasing your weight. Next slide, please. Um, this slide tells you alcohol effects on the body. Um, certainly on the brain, we know that if we drink too much, it could lead to some problems with staying oriented to person, place, and time. It affects many neurotransmitters up in the brain. As I noted, um, it can increase chronic alcohol misuse. is more likely to develop throat, mouth, esophageal, or stomach cancer. Heart disease, only in excess but in a great deal, many more than 12 or 20 beers a day or a fifth of liquor a day can lead to toxic effects on the heart known as an alcohol cardiomyopathy. We know that alcohol is primarily processed and detoxified in the liver, so there is a higher instance of liver problems such as cirrhosis or inflammation, or what we see more commonly is what's called fatty liver. Stomach distress, alcohol, because it's somewhat of an irritant, can lead to ulcers, and gastroesophageal reflux disease or esophagitis. Rarely, an excess can lead to an acute pancreatic problem known as pancreatitis. And again, in this time when we want our best functioning immune system, we don't need excess alcohol to decrease the function of the immune system to take away any advantage we may have over not only COVID or coronavirus, but also the seasonal flu virus or any pneumonia we might be exposed to. Next slide. The last slide, which I want to go over, is probably the hardest one for all of my patients and even our family and friends to attain, which is regular physical exercise and activity. I remember way back when, in high school, we had the President's Fitness Council that every young man or young woman in high school had to get a certificate by doing a shuttle run, a 600-yard run, so many push-ups, a rope climb, so many pull-ups. And I will be honest with you, with our current society, and kids locked out of school right now because of COVID and not able to learn except from a long distance or as we're doing right now through a WebEx or the internet, only 20% of adults are getting the recommended exercise or physical activity. And I would suspect it's probably similar and maybe just only slightly higher for our children and teens. The US government physical activity guidelines, which goes back to 2013, so seven years ago, has made it very simple. What do we need to do? What do I want for my heart to stay healthy? Ideally, we need 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic exercise 
every week. If I break that down simple, 150 minutes would basically be 30 minutes of aerobic exercise just five days a week. Five days, that's all I'm asking. And if you can't get to that because of work schedule or conflicts with your family, I'll even allow you to be a weekend warrior and give me two 75-minute sessions on a Saturday and Sunday. How do we define this? Well, moderate intensity is that level of exercise that gets you to burn three to six times as much energy as you would as we are right now sitting still. We call that three to six METs or metabolic equivalents. Some examples of this moderate intensity really are very simple. This would be walking brisk, and you can do this with your smartphone. You can do this with, your, with an app. Certainly, a lot of us now have uh, watches, whether it's an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, that you can measure that you're walking three to four miles per hour, mowing the lawn with a hand mower, bicycling 10 to 12 miles per hour, playing doubles tennis, badminton, um, on it, onward and upward. So really not the, uh, a significant strain on the body. Vigorous intensity exercise is considered any level above six METs or greater. This would be jogging six miles per hour, hiking on, on the weekend, whatever you consider somewhat of a nice hike. We're not there yet, but we're just about six to eight weeks away, shoveling snow. If you're going to cycle or do bicycling, now we're going to push it up to 14 to 16 miles per hour. Uh, more intense aerobic activities like basketball, soccer, or singles tennis. So really not that difficult, but like anything, sometimes we need a little jump start to get going. Next slide, please. Here are some of the benefits that we have noticed, and I think a lot of folks have noticed this year with the lockdown and with the COVID restrictions. We've got to get out and move, and I'm so happy to see kids in our neighborhood riding bikes, families walking together. Um, husbands and wives holding hands, partners out, um, talking to each other, getting the fresh air and looking outdoors to see the beautiful leaves changing color. But look at this, 20 different things that exercise can benefit. Obviously, the more you exercise, the more you burn fat off your body, it reduces body fat. It will definitely increase your lifespan. It increases oxygenation to your blood, and guess what? The more lungs expand, the higher oxygenation levels, not only the lower the risk we're going to get for this infection out there, but if we do get infected, the stronger our immune system will be to fight it off. It strengthens muscles. Why is that important? Well, as we get older, muscle mass loss is significant, especially for women. And if you lose muscle mass, you lose balance, you lose a lot of strength, and it puts you at a higher risk for hip fractures if you fall. Hip fractures are not benign. Women that have a hip fracture, as I said, have almost a 30 to 40 percent mortality rate after that fracture within six months to a year, either from developing pneumonia, blood clot in the leg, which can lead to a blood clot in the lung, or other complications after hip fracture surgery. It does help to manage pain. As my favorite physical therapist says, uh, motion is lotion. The more we move, the better the joints are lubricated for osteo and rheumatoid arthritis. As I noted just a second ago, it does ward off viruses. It does decrease the risk of diabetes. And just like doing push-ups twice a week can give us bigger biceps and triceps, when we exercise our heart, it strengthens the heart. It makes it much stronger. By exercising, we tend to get rid of more toxins in the bloodstream, and we tend to filter out the unhealthy fats and get rid of the triglycerides and the low LDL. If there's only one thing that will improve that beautiful HDL, the high-density lipoprotein or lipoprotein, it's exercise. It boosts our mood, helps with anxiety and depression, it helps us with social interaction and improves our mobility. A lot of studies out there showing that they can be a significant benefit for improving memory and decreasing Alzheimer's risk. Improves our hand-eye coordination. As I noted, strengthens our bones to lower that risk of fracture should we fall. Improves our complexion. Detoxifies chemicals in the body. Decreases stress. Boosts the immune system. And lowers the blood pressure as well as blood sugar and reduces overall cancer risk. So if I went to you today, you would think I was some sort of guy selling snake oil that I have a prescription for you that will give the 20 benefits in your life, and the prescription is something as simple as walking 30 minutes five days a week. That's unheard of. I have no pill, no vitamin, no supplement, nothing else in my arsenal to treat heart patients better than exercise. Next slide, please. Let's finish up, because we're almost at 11.40 here, and then I'll take some questions. Here are the take-home messages. As I used to say to my med students, 
you were given a pearl of knowledge, and pearls are always a great thing to receive from those who love you. You need to have an appropriate weight. You've got to stay on a heart-healthy diet, my favorite and one most recommended by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology is a Mediterranean diet. Don't smoke. Don't let your kids smoke, your grandkids, or anybody in your family. If you can help them, quit smoking. Very important to do so. Moderate alcohol intake. Ladies, no more than one drink a day. Men, no more than one to two drinks per day. And my most important pearl of wisdom and knowledge is getting that regular aerobic exercise. By following these recommendations, what was ultimately concluded in this paper in the American Heart Association, if you start this at age 50, a woman can theoretically extend her life expectancy by 14 years. Five simple measures, five. And you can increase your lifetime with your family, your friends, those you love, your significant other, your children, your grandchildren, 14 years, ladies. For men, same thing. If you start by working on your weight, getting your weight down, staying on a heart-healthy diet, quit those darn cigarettes or any form of tobacco use, get that exercise level up and going, 12 years for the gentleman out there. 12 more years to spend with those you love and care about. And I tell patients, simple ways to get going, Find an exercise program you like. If you like walking, walk. If you like cycling, cycling. When the pools open back up at the various YMCAs, hopefully you'll be able to get out and do some water aerobics or swim, elliptical trainer, Schwinn Aerodyne, whatever you like to keep moving. And with that, don't forget, it's important to do weights twice a week to increase those, the bone strength and muscle strength. Um, if you want, buy a dog. Dogs love you unconditionally. They help lower your blood pressure. They eat your leftovers. Dogs love to walk. Easily, a nice walk with your pup will give you 30 to 45 minutes, five to six days a week. Uh, next slide, please. Follow the American Heart Association guidelines. And I would like, at the end, I, I will put up there, if you go to the HA or ACC website, whenever you go to your care provider, please make sure you know your cholesterol levels. Total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides. They will always do your blood pressure when you come in for your visit and your heart rate. If you don't know, make sure you find out what your fasting blood sugar or hemoglobin A1C is, and know your BMI or body mass index. Make sure you know those. Next slide, please. Um, for those in the Wake Forest area, any new patients, and I hope Courtney, I put this up correctly. She'll correct me, Dan, if I'm wrong. We can, we'd love to see you. We'd be happy to help you out with any questions you have, not only for cardiovascular disease, but any problems concerning your health. The main number to call is 336-716-WAKE or 716-9253. If you're a little bit out of state or our friends up in Virginia or in South Carolina or uh, Tennessee, the toll-free number is 888-716-9253. And I would love for you to go to our website, wakehealth.edu. Lots of important information for you out there. Lots of things you can take um, and watch every day, even some of these previous lectures that have done by my colleagues. Uh, next slide, please. Resources you can find online for the American Heart Association, heart, H-E-A-R-T dot org, the American College of Cardiology, uh, not the Atlantic Coast Conference for my sports fans out there, but ACC dot org. If you need more information from our government, CDC dot gov, or NIH.gov has a multitude and a large number of, of papers you can look at, a large number of research studies, and some good common sense information. Uh, next slide, Courtney, I think that's about it. That's 